Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion on Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. Happy New Year for those of you that celebrate New Year at the beginning of January. We've got another New Year coming up right around the corner with Chinese New Year. Um, <clears throat> my name is, of course, is Dr. Lisa Greenhill. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer here at AAVMC. And uh, welcome again to the first episode of 2024. Um, so today's episode is a special episode. Um, we have never featured um, the AAVMC's whole kind of DEI data well and now well-being team all together on an episode. So today uh, you will get to meet all of these team members um, and uh, we're going to have a few questions. We're going to answer some questions that came in over the last um, two months or so when we were asking folks to, you know, hear, so we wanted to hear what they wanted to hear from us. So um, with that, I am very, very happy to introduce the AAVMC's uh, data diversity and well-being team, starting with Kendall Young and then Swavia Polisetti, who some of you may know from working or seeing her in the background on the side of the podcast from time to time. And of course, our wonderful newest member, Elizabeth Caballero. So uh, as is our practice on the show, Kendall, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm Kendall Young. Uh, I'm the Associate Director for Institutional Research and Diversity. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in international studies and my master of public administration, which focuses on nonprofit management. I've worked with the association or within the association space for 12 years. Um, nearly seven of those in March, it'll be seven years. I've been working with Dr. Green Hill here at AAVMC. Um, so prior to joining AAVMC, I worked with the American Dental Education Association where I managed their holistic review program. So um, since joining the team here, I work on a number of projects under the umbrella of this team. I run our largest data collection project of the year, the institutional data report, which some of you may recognize my name from quite a few emails uh, related to that project. The data from that project feeds our public data report on our website. And I also work on our admissions training programming and a large uh, number of survey projects. So that's just to name a few things, just to introduce you to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Slavia. Hi, everyone. I'm Sravya Polisetti. Um, I am a data analyst and project manager at AAVMC on the data diversity and well-being team. And like Lisa said, I also help produce the podcast. So you may have seen or heard my name around, you know, I upload the things, email everyone. Um, I have been working at AAVMC for three years in February. And I have a background in data analysis. My bachelor's is in biotechnology. So up until working at AMVMC, I've spent a lot of time doing like various data projects for different organizations. Um, but at AMVMC, I've had the chance to work on different analysis related to like well being or, um, and like the match salary reports I tend to work on. And I've also helped work on DEI efforts such as like the DEI glossary and other things like that. Great. Thank you. EC. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth, or EC, my first and last initials. I'm the new manager for well-being and professional competencies with the AAVMC. I just started in January. Uh, before I worked here, I worked with Appalachian State University as their associate director of wellness and prevention services, where I did a lot of public health work uh, for that institution, and, and I also worked in Florida for a little bit working on their state suicide prevention uh, grant. So I'm excited to be here. I'm have, I have my master's in public health um, and I'm a master certified health education specialist. Welcome. We are so excited um, to have you join our team. So welcome, welcome. So let's dig in. Again, we have a number of questions um, that um, were sent in. And this first one, I'm going to have Kendall kind of 
um, um, maybe do the initial response and then we can all kind of pitch in a little bit. But, you know, what lessons do you think we're learning, um, especially in the DEI space around kind of equity from our non-US based institutions? Like we used to be, you know, overwhelmingly, I mean, and we still have a majority, I guess, of of the schools, our members in the U.S., but clearly our membership has dramatically changed. What you know? What do you think we're getting from that? Yeah, that was a great question. Um, when we when I saw it, I gave it a lot of thought, and I wanted to start um, by kind of talking more about the organization uh, about AABMC because um, it was exciting for me to work with an organization where so many of our members are based internationally. Um, just over 41% actually of our members are international and our international members are actively engaged and have crucial roles in all of our committees and organizational leadership. Um, we have committees within our organization that are set up specifically for international school input and engagement. And we're constantly learning from our international membership in so many ways. Um, so one example of a committee that I know that Dr. Greenhill, you've worked really closely with, um, is our Council on International Veterinary Medical Education, or we call them CIVME. Um, and CIVME was created to provide a global leadership in academic veterinary medicine. Um, their goal, for those of you watching who don't know anything about CIVME, is to promote uh, collaboration, foster innovation, and share best practices on a worldwide scale to advance the quality of teaching and learning in veterinary medical education. So uh, SIDME is currently comprised of eight major global regions, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, continental Europe, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East and North Africa and UK and Ireland and the United States and Canada. Um, so I wanted to ask Dr. Green Greenhill, uh, did you wanna share more about the work that you've done with SIDME recently? Yeah, you know, um, as as the organization really continues to grow, we've got a number of new members outside of the U.S. We have, um, you know, we're on the precipice of pretty dramatic growth um, domestically as well. Um, our engagement in, you know, councils like or committees like CIVME really, from my perspective, gives should give us a little um, opportunity to just kind of stop and and. Oftentimes, when we have these kinds of external global groups, there is a very westernized, like, hey, let us help you understand what the best practices are. Let us tell you what the gold standard is. And, um, you know, that is a very, I'm not going to say the West doesn't do things great, but that doesn't mean that everybody else, the East and, and wherever else, doesn't do it great as well. And that there should be some. Um, mutual learning that there shouldn't be this kind of um, kind of colonial paternalistic approach to um, you know peer institutions whether they have chosen to you know pursue U.S. accreditation or not and so um, so it has really kind of embarked my work and um, my work with that particular um, organ, you know, in a committee within AABMC to really kind of think through what does decolonizing um, CIVME mean, right? What can we learn about best practices and best pedagogy and veterinary medical education globally without centering kind of, you know, um, U.S., um, Western Europe, you know, Australian schools, right? What other kinds of things can we find um, tremendous value in? And so, um, you know, it is an extension of the work that we've been committed to, but it is different. And and I think I think for me as a professional, it's it's really exciting work, but it is also hard to pull that root. <laughs> it's hard to pull that root. Um, because you know the it, when you are creating things um, and with some of these frameworks, it's really kind of hard to kind of break it up um, and make it function the way that you want. But but we're optimistic. So yeah, yeah. So um, the next question, and I'm gonna um, um, I'm gonna give Kendall a quickie break. Um, don't worry, she's gonna weigh in on this one too, and and so we'll. Hopefully, hopefully it's so what you see. Um, but I'm gonna start with Slavia. So what do you think the role of data in, 
is in advancing equity um, in vet med? And, and, you know, what are some of the limits around that? I think data plays a really important role in advancing things like equity. And I don't think a lot of people really think of it that way, because traditionally, when you think of data, you think of science experiments where you are in a lab and you do like the results and you see the numbers that way. But actually, there's a lot of value in the kinds of research that we do in terms of analyzing demographic information, um, surveys to get a sense of where the population is on certain issues or what circumstances they might be exposed to. And knowing that information is really important to be able to create changes in like policy or um, other things like that to help benefit those communities. And when we have data, we can make informed decisions from that instead of just like trying to see what will work um, or what won't. And it's really important for that data to come from as many sources as possible so we can really make sure we're addressing the needs of the community. Um, but there are limitations in terms, especially of more qualitative sort of data that we collect in terms of, for example, if we collect data about certain demographic groups, um, it can't be broadly applicable to every other kind of group that's similar to them, you know, because the conclusion that you make about one group that's applicable to that one specific group that you're sampling. And so I think it's important to remember that while data is incredibly useful, that we shouldn't try to extrapolate all of these other things from them um, without having enough information. You can definitely see trends over time and make educated guesses that way, but it's important to make sure that you're representing what you do have truthfully. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the big criticisms when people are kind of, especially in this age of misinformation, you can make statistics say anything. And I'm like, well, it depends on the data set, but I mean, yeah, it depends on the data set, right? But but again, this kind of idea of what does the evidence really tell us, right? And so it's not just one study, but like, what does a body of work tell us? Yeah, Elizabeth, you look like you were about to jump in. Come on in. No, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm listening, but uh, I was going to, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how when we look at data especially related to like public health and well-being, it's often the marginalized populations that are struggling the most. And when we do interventions, we target the populations that are having the largest struggles. And that usually brings the rates down across the board. And that's also the same thing with accessibility. When we make things accessibility accessible for the most people, it benefits everyone right. down the line. So it is really important to look at your data and see which populations are struggling the most and create those interventions or programs specifically for that population because it you will see it yeah. help everybody. Yeah. 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 What? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I was also thinking when we were talking about Sydney, um, in terms of the data that we get from just working with that group, like the context communication exercise that we had done, which was really interesting and in like um, in terms of trying to figure out how best that all of these different groups and regions were communicating. And so that kind of data, people don't think of it as data, but it is. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly useful in terms of trying to help um, marginalized communities, underrepresented communities, and try to like keep the mindset of not just Western centric um, principles and policies. Yeah, so the high-low um, uh, context communication training is something I offered last year through AAVMC Learn. Um, stay tuned. There may be some opportunities to take it this, this semester. We'll see uh, what my schedule looks like. But basically, you know, different um, populations have different cultures, right? And, and sometimes that's along um, race, ethnicity, uh, religion, um, locate geography, all kinds of different things. Um, but what ends up happening in those populations is that there's kind of a, um, 
a communication norm, right? And so in some um, in some places, like in some, you know, romance language con company uh, countries, you are like, oh, you talk with the hands and the da, 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 very, very high contacts, right? Um, very plugged into kind of um, reading verbals and nonverbals versus low context where it's like the paper says one, two, three, four. It doesn't, it doesn't say four and a half. It says four and it says five, right? There's no reading between the lines, that kind of thing. And um, and it was really cool to do that training, not just with like I'd done it with folks in the US or in kind of westernized culture, but to do it with folks from around the world was super cool. Um, a really great opportunity. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kindle. Yeah, I just wanted to um, chime in more too about the limitations, because um, I would say a significant limitation uh, would be how we can use demographic data where the numbers are too small. Um, you know, we don't want to identify anyone in our analysis. So sometimes we're unable to share findings that we might find or might that might be helpful in fear that they might, you know, do more harm than good. Um, so I think that's something our team uh, has to work with uh, yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other thing that we had talked about um, in our kind of pre pre production um, discussion was um, categories and how you know demographics is are rapidly changing. Folks are um, have a lot more freedom and desire, maybe more desire than freedom, <laughs> desire to identify, self identify, and. We recognize it from a research perspective, from a social sociology perspective, psychological perspective, how important that is. From a purely research perspective, especially a quantitative research perspective, it's a little crazy um, because, you know, you create so many categories. For example, gender identity categories are really um, um, a large and increasingly large group. And if you want to be really inclusive, it's in important to have all of, you know, a wide array of, um, of categories. The challenge then becomes though, when you have to do the actual analysis, like when Swabia gets the data file and it's, you know, three people checked this box out of a thousand and four people checked that box out of a thousand. Um, and, you know, you just have lots and lots of onesies and twosies. We have to collapse that data in order to try to get a critical mass of folks um, that we can actually do these tests against. And, and what we end up finding is that that group ends up being way more diverse from their own perspective, but all of that gets lost in the shuffle because we have to keep combining groups, right? And so like when I do some of my analysis, I actually ha might have, okay, here's sexual minorities, but then here's also sexual and gender minorities. And I had to consolidate and you know make sure there's no double counting just so I have a critical enough number of individuals that I can meet that base threshold to run the data. Um, and so, you know, I'm like, okay, I need, a, I need, okay, well, this will be my queer group because I, that's an umbrella term. I'm going to go with that. But, but that group has lots of people that don't have anything to do with each other in it. And so, you know, there's some real ethical challenges around um, what is the appropriate thing to do when um, the categories are important and yet from a statistical perspective, it makes it incredibly difficult to study. I definitely think that's also like communicating that problem is also a huge limitation in terms of working with data. Like we as researchers understand that problem and know what we have to do to try to work around it. But I don't think if people aren't used to working with that kind of data and analyzing it that way, it might not register. Um, so I definitely think like communication regarding data practices is also something that there can be a limitation around in terms of using it to advance equity and things like that. And I think that's definitely an area we can see a lot of improvement in. Yeah, yeah. I think some basic research education would be helpful, but again, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> 
it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mess, right? It's a it's a bit of a a, a, a knot um, to kind of press through. So next question from the field. Um, so we'll go around the fishbowl and uh, thoughts on. Well, first of all, thoughts on the SCOTUS decision from last year um, uh, and kind of some of the reactionary kind of policies that kind of jumped off since then that just don't have anything to do with anything. Now, I'm going to, because Elizabeth is new, I'm going to give her second on this one, but she hails from the great state uh, in the UNC system. So I'm eager to hear her perspective. <laughs> but Kendall, why don't you <laughs> say, you know, that day, what'd you think? Yeah. Um, well, as you know, uh, working with admissions programming, um, you know, this, this has been a hot topic, um, when it comes to admissions. Um, and also, you know, we're still kind of seeing how, uh, the impact is happening everywhere. This, this a lot of states are obviously doing their own thing. Um, and I would say, you know, we're just, from an AAVMC perspective, we're working on our admissions programming. We're coming up with um, new ways to kind of um, address the uh, the issues and navigate the situation. Um, we're gonna be coming out with more content on our LMS. Um, we're going to be having some workshops coming up, uh, a lot of resources to try to help um, our schools to navigate uh, and you know, especially at the local level as well, not just uh, with the SCOTUS decisions, but the ripple effects of that um, as well. So uh, I can tell you we have resources coming. <laughs> All right, you from the North State, North Carolina. <laughs> What's up, EC? What's hey. going on there? Yeah, so Are you all clutch the pearl shock? <laughs> No. <laughs> um, so, I mean, North Carolina had the bathroom bill that was in place and then it got repealed when our new governor came in. Um, so North Carolina is firmly a purple state. Um, we have a conservative Congress and a Democratic governor. Uh, so the, the UNC system controls pretty much everything that happens in North Carolina. I do think the reaction to the SCOTUS decision, it was then shut down all DEI work, which is disappointing. Um, but I firmly believe that a lot of the work around DEI that schools are doing is surface level. So if they're really committed to DEI, this is not necessarily a stop doing DEI. I feel like it's a chance to look deeper and to do things more systemically that are going to be helpful regardless. So looking at your admission policies in general and seeing how are they excluding people from different backgrounds in ways that don't have to be DEI specific. Um, how are your programs that you're doing really the shift in North Carolina has been serving all students. That's kind of the language and trying to be a place of belonging for for all students. So I think it's looking at a lot of different things, looking at hiring practices, um, things like that. But no, it was not a surprise to me. I mean, it, it had been in the works for, well, for a while. Yeah. 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 This wasn't this wasn't new. Um, I mean, and I think I think those of us that had been around since the last hurrah, um, you know, from the Grutter year, Grutter and Grads years in the early 2000s to um, uh, the Fisher cases, like, it, you know, this was, it was coming. Um, it was kind of inevitable, inevitable um, in some ways, much like the Dobbs decision. I think that um, like just, Lisa-ism, I didn't, I was shocked that people were shocked last, well, I guess that's the year before last, with the Dobbs decision, I was like, this is not surprising, even with the leaked thing, like, not, not surprising, we could have written this, but, um, you know, I think that folks were a little bit more prepared this time, um, I think that it was more a, like, well, what will the, um, what will it include and what won't it include? And there are still some 
spacey things in there that, you know, um, the court kind of carved out some space, like, hey, you can glean this stuff from essays. You can't ask for it, but you can get this information from essays. <laughs> Um, so, you know, then it means, okay, well, what kinds of essay prompts elicit the type of data that you want, right? This is something that AAVMC had already started talking about. So, um, you know, I think that that is something I think that we had really kind of started getting our members to think about not only with respect to DEI, but with respect to well-being in terms of don't ask people to tell you traumatic histories <laughs> to get into, to get into vet school, bad practice, bad, bad. Um, but uh, I think the, it has been really challenging because you see the threats across higher ed. Um, you know, we have a, a wonderful institution at University of Missouri. Well, you know, M Missouri chopped everything overnight. No scholarships, no nothing. Everything that, you know, they could, they did. And, um, you know, I think that that time will tell in terms of the shifting um, based on, um, you know, I think that that we still, we like to think of education to some degree as a public good, right? That, well, we're supposed to um, <laughs> think of it as a public good, um, but um, we also need to, the reality to understand that at the price point that this public good currently is, it is a consumer driven kind of economy and students are gonna walk and register where they feel comfortable um, and and access, as accessible. And I think that all of the pressures that institutions have seen to provide more service to students is gonna, um, I think that that's gonna continue. I don't know. Uh, Saravia, you are the closest, she is our cusp staff person <laughs> on the cusp of the millennial Z um, uh, uh, faction. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, like, what are your peers talking about? Um, my peers are all good. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like applying for graduate schools is just such a weird experience in terms of what the applicant experience is it's hard to I know when I was applying for like my undergraduate it wasn't at the forefront of my mind in terms of like what the campus culture would be just because of where I grew up um it was a decently diverse area and I didn't really consider those kinds of things but I think this generation that's upcoming and the ones younger than me it's a lot more like in the front of their minds in terms of what kinds of things can affect them and how their well-being and um, overall like culture is important to them. So yeah. I think it's definitely going to be something that's very much more um, of like a deciding factor for a lot of people yeah. in terms of where they end up going to school. Like I feel like a lot of people will just like count out certain states um, even more than they might already. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Like count out certain states and have to pay out of state to like you've already decided to go out of state and then you would go. Yeah. There are parents that are like, absolutely not. So I did that with my daughter in state. Like I just, like there's some places, you know, and even the town that she did her first year of undergrad in, I not thrilled about the location. She was okay. And she ended up being safe, but not thrilled about the location. Anyway, any other thoughts on all the fallout from SCOTUS. I guess so, yeah. the, I, know, I know the faculty and staff who are working on this issue really do care. So yeah. that's really heart, heartening to see that they're trying to figure out how to do it with this legislation. And I am curious to see how they end up figuring yeah. that out. Yeah. yeah, yes, um, we're all kind of just, just you know, I think that this application cycle is going to teach us a lot about kind of, you know, how the landscape has changed. So, all right. So building faculty and staff population for DEI programs. So, um, so we just got the statement wasn't kind of phrased more as a question. So it can be interpreted a couple of different ways. Um, so, um, 
EC, I'm going to actually start with you. Like, imagine what kinds of things in your previous role maybe did you do to kind of get folks engaged in like well-being programs? And what do you think might be some applicable things that we could use in vet med? Yeah, I'll start with saying that the people who are most likely to probably come to your well-being or DI programs probably need it the least. They're already plugged in and interested and they've most likely done a lot of learning on their own. I would see the same people at every program. And I was like, I'm so glad you're here. And this is the same thing I talked about last year. Like, <laughs> This is not new. Uh, but I think it's important to identify those champions. I call them champions on your campus, whether it's in well-being or DEI. Recognize the ones who are really passionate about the work, because those are the ones who can potentially encourage their network to their network to come to stuff or they're they're the ones who are going to bring the work into their classroom so at least you can reach their students or if you can get like a chair or something like that involved they might encourage strongly encourage in North Carolina nothing was allowed to be mandated so strongly encourage uh, their staff to attend things or be involved with things but to continually engage with those champions and those partners and to create committees where y'all are meeting regularly, a committee that has a goal, um, preferably not just one that needs to <laughs> talk because the talking doesn't necessarily do much. But even if it's a small goal, like I had a committee where our goal every semester was just to create an event, but it was an event that every single department was working on. So we all had a mini goal that also helped us with our discussion and it made us work together on that. So having, even if it's a little goal, but yeah, those champions, ha having them do some of the work for you, cultivating those relationships, I think is really important. I love that you actually brought up the goal and that it made us chuckle because I think that there are, I know I've seen countless DEI groups and they are meeting on a regular basis and they have great ideas to do stuff and they are going to do something one day, but there is actually not a goal. <laughs> like, like, the goal is to do something one day and it's like, okay, so what's the something? We don't have a goal for setting the something, <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, and I mean, it also gets to like, why did you create the committee? What does the charge look like? What do those organizing pieces look like? Why are you, why are you doing this? Now, I'm also a fan of group therapy, and sometimes you just need an appointment on the calendar for that <laughs> to just blow off some some steam. But you know, um, I, I think that there's probably a better approach. <laughs> so some definitely some 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 uh, good ideas. Uh, Kendall, any lessons learned from dentistry way back, way back in the recesses of your mind? I was going to say, it's been a long time, <laughs> seven years. I, I, I can't remember. No. I mean, what I would say is I think uh, over all these years, uh, what I've learned is it more broad programming. It kind of aligns with what Elizabeth is saying, you know, broader programming, um, training for everyone is so important. I, and I think you're more likely to kind of uh, get a, all of the audiences at the table when you, you know, require everyone to have um, certain trainings and certain knowledge. Um, and also that will then be a part of your culture as, an, as a school as well, yeah. which is key and very important. Um, I would say that's been one of my biggest takeaways. Yeah. 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 I'd also say you gotta make it easy. People cool. love to do long programs like we've come to this day long thing, come to this four hour thing, short, sweet, quick. I mean, if you can get that thing to be half an hour, if you can get it to be half an hour online, even better. But short and sweet is going to win more people over. And then the people who want more, you can give them those follow up opportunities. But if you're really trying to reach more people, you got to make it easy. I would also say the more systemic level things you can do versus programming, the better off you're going to be because that's going to impact more people than any amount of, you can have a huge program 
300 people can come to it, it's still not going to impact as many people as a systemic change that would impact the entire um, college would. Yes. Such a great, great point. Yeah, that systemic level stuff. I mean, and again, it gets back to, you know, I think what I mentioned earlier, this moving from this, I, I need these kinds of, um, you know, mental health opportunities or DEI programs for this particular group versus let's shift the focus, let's shift um, the institution so that the baseline is at a different place where folks are getting what they need, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and this is one of the reasons I think so many even veterinary organizations and, and groups outside, just education and organizations in general, have gotten into micro learning and our attention spans are terribly short. Then you add on a layer for a bunch of us with neurospiciness where we're just like squirrel. <laughs> you know, um, you know, you need to kind of get in and get out um, and, and think about that high impact thing. And again, this is a different, this to me is, it's not necessarily decolonizing education, but it is a, a pretty crazy rapid innovation where, you know, we have, especially in, again, Western society, sage on the stage, Plato, Socrates, kind of, you know, lecture didactic, we're becoming more experiential, but this kind of recognition that you can learn more complex things in shorter periods of time with, you know, the short duration, high impact, um, and then do that over and over again in different ways can be, you know, um, as productive as, academically as sitting in an, a room for a long, long, long time, <laughs> right? Like these are not cooking classes and I'm not saying y'all are boring, but I'm just saying these are not often cooking. Like, you know, you're not taking a product home. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're looking for something that feels a little harder to manage and, and is intangible. I don't know. Savia? Yeah, you know? I, I definitely think that's like an area where um, a lot more people could utilize like different forms of programming or different ways to communicate. Like I think that's something AABMC does really well in terms of we have the podcast, we have a book club, we have like you've done movie um marathon and yeah, the film festival the virtual film festival, festival. that's the word yeah. thank you um, and it's just all of these different sources of information that people can access and use to try to learn the way that works best for them and I think that's definitely something that like is important to move forward in that space and there's a lot of opportunity there yeah great all right okay so here is the last question that we got from the um, the masses. So let's talk a little bit about ways um, the colleges have infused DEI into the curriculum and evidence-based practice. Um, and, and what can we learn from other um, disciplines like public health? So EC is clearly the star today. So what? <laughs> What's up? Yeah, so I have my master's in public health. I also teach public health classes. Um, I will say public health and other medical fields or fields, they help people. So it's a lot of times, built, whereas like the veterinary field, yes, y'all help, you help people. You help the people who have their pets, but you're helping the pets too. And so your accreditation standards, your code of ethics look a little bit different than the other fields. And so for public health, where our focus is serving the community, it is written into our code of ethics many different times, many different ways that we are supposed to focus on social justice, on marginalized communities, on diversity and equity. So then that's written into the accreditation standards, then it's then 
put into the coursework by the by the faculty. But I will say a lot of times it depends on who's teaching the class, whether or not they truly infuse that. But it's more likely, I think, to be infused in some of these other fields. Social work is the same. Nursing is similar where they're, it's in those accreditation and in those ethical documents. So if I'm teaching an introduction to public health class, I'm going to be talking about environmental health. I'm going to be talking about how people who are forced to live in places because they can't afford it, where there's more environmental hazards like poor air, poor water, poor um, soil, the walls have lead in them. That's I'm going to talk about that when I talk about environmental health. I might talk about different statistics around mental health when we talk about mental health. So it's going to be built into the curriculum in that way, because as a public health practitioner, that has always been on the forefront of my mind. How do we address the most marginalized populations? So I think what you can learn from that, if it's not, I looked, I've looked at the D, the accreditation standards. It's not as heavily in the veterinary ones as it is in these other fields. But I think you can still consider how can I infuse DEI into the curriculum when I'm teaching about other things? Because you don't need a DEI course to talk about DEI. You don't need uh, like a course that's specifically about social justice or yeah. um, equity in the veterinary field. It shouldn't actually be in just one course. You should really be as much as possible putting it in in as many different courses as you can, just a little bit. Like you're talking yeah. about this topic, this is how that might relate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are my first initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, and and it, it, it pairs well with some of the things that I've seen um, over the years. I remember the very first time that I saw a DEI presentation and it featured, um, um, veterinarians from around the world, um, and it was actually at Savma some some years ago, um, and it was about kind of this inter intersectional issues in um, in vet med, and so you know there was someone there talking about um, pain management and how there was a history of like pain management at, at some point in vet med that you know. And, you know, he, he talked about this parallel um, in, in recognizing that, um, you know, African-Americans have a long documented history of not receiving adequate pain medication and analgesia in human medicine because that, you know, they didn't think we needed it or, you know, it didn't hurt as much. The skin is thicker. It's tougher. It's not skin. It's a hide. All these kinds of, of things that aligned us with, hey, well, we don't give animals those things, right? You know, and so, and it wasn't like this gigantic deal, but it, but it was, right? Because it just puts that little piece of information, contextual information there. Um, when we have a lot of these international trips um, where we're taking veterinary students and some of the ethics around, like, these are not licensed professionals and they are providing a great service, but are they providing an ethical service to this population of underserved, marginalized individuals, right? Um, are they, is it a spay neuter clinic in a very, um, you know, um, uh, conservative environment that does not believe in any type of kind of, you know, um, reproductive kind of um, um, issues? Like, they wouldn't want women, they wouldn't want folks identifying as women or men to kind of have parts removed for the for lack of procreation, right? To prevent procreation. Um, um, and so like, how do you navigate that? Um, how do you navigate that in space in shelter medicine? Um, you know, and so, and these are all things that bring us, um, and none of us are actual veterinarians, but bring the profession um, you know, serving the community and how do you, how do you 
navigate that, right? And so, and and as much as I know for for me, I've been around for a long time. I think about these things, but I, like that's my training. And that's what y'all asked me to do to sit around and think about this stuff. But um, but that has to be taught, right? It has to be taught. I never thought about some of this stuff before I started working in vet med. Like so, yeah. So speaking of, of never having thought about some of these things that you thought of now that you've been hanging around vet med, um, we're going to give EC a break because she's only been with us for less than a month. Um, Kendall, weirdest thing. <laughs> and weirdest. this is not on, look, this was not in pre-production. <laughs> weirdest thing that I've learned. Is that the question? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I've learned so much, so much of it, not weird, but quite a few weird things. I would say probably, I don't know what the weirdest one has been. Do you, Saravia? I'm trying to think on the spot. I think if I had to think of one on the spot, it would just be like, like I didn't realize how many vet students would adopt animals while they're in vet school. Like I've heard that come up a few times um, in terms of like the population tends to have like a lot more, especially like animals with more comprehensive needs. And I was like, oh, I never considered that because all the people that I know that are in like human healthcare, they don't, you can't do that. Um, so not uh, picking people up at the bus station. No. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that makes, I mean, it makes sense, but I like never considered that's a thing that they would like be experiencing and that would affect how they're functioning and like navigating the space and all that. I yeah. Know, just probably. Yeah. Yeah. By and the I, way, vet students, it can increase your debt by as around about 10K at the end of your degree. 10K. We love the animals, but don't adopt anymore. <laughs> While you're yeah, yeah I, would, I would just add that I, I love animals. I'm an animal lover. And so for me to hear so many interesting facts about animals, especially from our veterinary colleagues, um, our veterinarian colleagues. Um, you know, I've learned all kinds of things about uh, such unique, interesting animals. Um, so I have to say that it's my favorite part. Um, I have so many favorite parts of working with all of you, but uh, I love the facts that we learn, especially uh, uh, between our veterinarian colleagues on staff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, uh, Elizabeth hasn't also had um, dinner yet with um, <laughs> a bunch of veterinarians. It's a, you just wait till, you know, a few of those rural animal vets start talking about their long days on the farm. Um, uh, good times. Uh, all right. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, I love this team. Um, we are really excited about some of the things that we are expecting to do in the next year. Um, we've got a lot of podcast episodes kind of in the works, um, but we will right now, our next episode will be um, in about four weeks um, and it will feature Dr. Lisa Meeks and Dr. Leslie Springer. And we'll be talking about uh, technical competencies um, and the new document that AAVMC released last fall. So with that, um, again, I want to oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us and um, going into our, our eighth year and uh, thank the data diversity and well-being team for joining me on this well-being episode. Thanks everybody. Awesome. So with that, please sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app and feel free to send us um, messages at diversitymatters at aavmc.org. Thanks. See you next time.